tonight, Romans chapter 1 and, uh, and uh, verses 8 through 12. As first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you in my prayers, by making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established, that is, they, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Uh, two Wednesday nights ago, I began a new series of messages on the subject of prayer, and, and here's, what, uh, here's the kind of the concept that I'm trying to get across. Remember in Luke chapter 11, the disciples came to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples, and Jesus began began to teach his disciples to pray and he said when you pray say our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and uh, so forth and goes on from there and and here's the thing that came to my mind you know Jesus is the master teacher they asked Jesus to teach them to pray Jesus who is the master teacher answered their prayer uh, and taught them to pray. And I've got to thinking about it. Well, if he taught the apostles how to pray, they probably got something to tell us about praying. And uh, so I got to just, what I wanted to do is just go through the, uh, the, um, the New Testament, especially, both the, especially the epistles and um, the writings of the apostles there. And I want to see what they can teach us about praying, both in their epistles and in their, the recorded prayers of the apostles. And, and so that's kind of what we're going to be doing over the next however long it takes to do this. We'll be looking at it really a, a book by book of the New Testament, talking about those epistles there, of the New Testament, looking to see what we can learn about prayer, both by what the, the apostles taught on the subject of prayer and also by the examples that we will have of, of, their, of their own personal prayers. So that's what we're going to do uh, in this series as we go through there. So we're going to begin tonight... Uh, with the book of Romans. It is the first of the epistles. Um, brought that first message, kind of just a summary on uh, some things about um, uh, the apostles and prayer. Uh, tonight we're going to start in the book of Romans with the, um, what the apostle Paul had learned about prayer. Now somebody, and I know I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago too, but somebody can say, well the apostle Paul wasn't there when the, when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, Luke chapter 11. And it is true that the Apostle Paul was not there um, and, uh, when Jesus, when the disciples asked that question. And it is true that he was not there when Jesus answered that, uh, their request and taught them, you know, our Father which art in heaven, pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so forth. Uh, but, but Paul, while he wasn't there at that time, Paul does say he was instructed of the Lord. Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 18, he says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach uh, him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him, for 15, abode with him 15 days. Now I take that to mean that the apostle Paul was personally trained by the Lord Jesus Christ while he was in the desert of Arabia for a period of about three years. And, uh, and personally taught, of course, the disciple, all the other apostles were trained during a three year, about three and a half year period of time. And I personally believe that the apostle Paul had the same experience, kind of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. During those three years, he had, he had um, separated himself from the brethren, uh, been, you know, after having to flee Damascus, had headed up back into his home area where he had grown up. And, um, and he says for three years, I believe he's saying for three years he had been in 
instructed by given revelation of Jesus Christ, given instruction in that period of time. And, um, and, and I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ taught him there how to pray. Because uh, I'll tell you something, if there's anything we can learn about the Apostle Paul at all, the man knew to pray. He was a prayer warrior. And so um, in Romans chapter, um, I, I, well, I guess I want to back up. I find the word prayer. So we're going to start in the book of Romans, Paul's message in the book of Romans. And what we can learn about prayer in the book of Romans, I find the word prayer or one of the forms of the word prayer found five different times in the book of Romans. I just want to go real quickly through each of those five. We're not going to, this won't be the message tonight, but I just want to make sure you see them all tonight. So in Romans chapter eight, and I've taken them out of order so that I can kind of lead to a uh, lead to the place that I want to preach this evening. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. The Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, I guess that's kind of the whole premise of this series I'm going to preach is right there, is we don't know how to pray for what we ought. That's the point that I'm going to be trying to get across and that I want to try to, I want to find out what to pray for is what I'm going to be after. Now, he says that since we don't know how to pray, we don't know what to pray for like we ought to, the Holy Ghost prays for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And that's a good thing. I'm glad to know the Holy Ghost is praying and that when my heart is burdened and when I have a desire to pray, even though I may not know the right things to pray for and to pray about, the Holy Spirit does and he's getting the job done for me. But I don't think that that gives me an excuse not to learn what to pray for. The best is, is, as is possible, I need to study the Word of God and I need to know what things I ought to be praying for. That's what I'm looking for in this series. I want to see what it was that the apostles would pray for when they prayed for people. What would they pray for? That's what I want to find out uh, in this series. Romans chapter 12 and verse 12 is the second one. He says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Now Romans chapter 12, he had started talking about um, the the gifts of the Spirit and when we're given these gifts and some of them will be ruling gifts and some of them will be teaching gifts and some of them will be helping gifts and so forth and he goes once we've got those gifts he begins to describe the person who is um, I'm going to call it spirit filled who is being led by and uh, controlled by the Holy Spirit and he describes this person and some of the things he says about that person who is controlled by the Holy Spirit he'll be rejoicing in hope he'll be patient in tribulation he'll be con he, and he will he will be continuing instant in prayer. And, and, um, and that ought to be when a person is submitted to the Holy Spirit, you're going to find that they, that they pray and, um, and that it is a, it's kind of like a, a natural thing when, when uh, everything drives them to prayer and brings them to the place of prayer. Romans chapter 15 and verse 30 is the third one. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you Strive not together with me in your prayers to God. I'm sorry, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Now, Paul gives us here a hint about um, the way prayer is conducted. He says prayer, effectual prayer. He says, I want you to strive together with me in your prayers. And, uh, and so his plea is for them to be involved in, uh, the Bible says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he says prayer should be a, a striving kind of a thing. He wanted them to strive in their prayer life. And then Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now here we're learning something about the prayer life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he never quit praying for these people. He never gave up on the requests he had to God for them. He would not cease to pray for them. Every time he prayed, he included these people in his prayers. That's what he says there. Without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. And then Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 is the final time you find the word prayer in one of its forms found in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, the apostle Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, I think verse, I think Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 is the heart of the book of Romans. Um, 
uh, I believe that the, the subject of the book of Romans is the doctrine of salvation. The burden of the book of Romans has to do with the subject of salvation. Both the idea, uh, the desire to see people get saved, and also the desire that those who are saved would comprehend the wonder of being saved. That those who are saved would, would come to understand the great gift and the great blessing that God has given us in prayer uh, or given us in salvation. Paul said, I'm going to go back and read Romans chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. He says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. All right? So now he says, this is, this is the truth. He says, God is my witness. Every time I pray, I pray for you people. I make mention of you in my prayers. And he says, This is what I make request for. If by any means, now at length I may have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you, for I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. Paul said the reason he prayed for them is so that he could come to them and impart unto them a spiritual gift. He called it some spiritual gift for the purpose to the end that they may be established. And I want to give you something, you know, through this series, really that's going to be my, my desire and my burden in this series, is to give you something in this series that in, to impart, can I put it like that, some spiritual gift that'll establish you, that'll build you up in your faith, that'll strengthen you in your faith, that'll give you some stability in your faith, especially in the area of prayer and learning how to pray and learning what to pray for as we ought and getting a, 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 getting a hold of the things that God would have us to pray about. I want to give you something that'll help in your faith. And I'm of the opinion that the thing Paul wanted to impart to them, that spiritual gift, he said, I want it to come so I can impart it to you some spiritual gift. I'm of the opinion that this spiritual gift he wanted to impart unto them what had to do with this doctrine of salvation. These were saved people. The book of Romans is written to a saved group. He does say his heart's desire and prayer uh, to God for Israel is that they would be saved. And so I think he's interested in, in souls being saved. But when he writes the book of Romans, he's really writing uh, concerning the doctrines that surround salvation. And he's saying uh, to these believers, I'd like to impart to you something that it has to do with the doctrine of salvation because I believe if you can get a hold of salvation and understand what God did when God saved you that it'll establish you that it'll strengthen you that it'll give you a solid foundation for your life for the Lord Jesus Christ I think that's what he's getting at Look, the, book of, the book of Romans is, is in fact all about salvation. Uh, uh, basically, cover to cover, chapter by chapter, the book of Romans has to do with the subject of, of salvation. I believe that Paul prayed that he could get to Rome to teach them and to establish them concerning the doctrines of salvation. Listen, very few things would be better for us and very few things would strengthen our relationship with the Lord and very few things would change our lives more than having a better uh, hold on the doctrine of salvation. What it happened or what happened to us the moment we got saved, the moment we got saved. And wouldn't it be, if you just want to ask you to think about this for, wouldn't it be something worth praying for that people would understand salvation? That souls obviously pray for souls to get saved. But that wouldn't it be? A, wouldn't that be a worthwhile? I mean, you talk about something you can pray fervently for, something that you can, I mean, get excited about praying for people about. Sometimes I have trouble praying for things. I, I uh, you know, I, I understand the the, the um, um, uh, book of Matthew. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you know, where two or three are, uh, where, uh, agree in my name, you have what to, you ask, and um, you know the idea of agreement. And sometimes I have a little bit of trouble. I'm not sure whether I agree with people, the things that people are asking me to pray for or not. And there's times like that. But if someone said, would you just pray that I understood my salvation better? I can tell you this. I'd get, I could get excited about praying for somebody that they would really understand salvation. And that they'd really get a hold of it. Do you know somebody just ask you to think about this. Do you know somebody right now that in, you believe that they've given a testimony of salvation? They've told you that they are children of God, but, they, but right now you know you're convinced they don't really understand how wonderful being saved is? Wouldn't it be a great thing just come to a place in your life where you just, I mean, where you recognize that was something when you prayed for that person, you could pray for them. God help them to understand the wonder of the salvation that you gave to them. 
And uh, so the book of Romans, I've got to go through this fast. I find it seven major topics, and there's really more than that, but uh, seven major topics that have to do with salvation that are addressed and dealt with in the book of Romans. There's not enough time, obviously, for us to, you know, go through in depth these topics. I just want to give them to you in, 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 in a kind of a, a, a survey kind of a fashion. Seven uh, major topics on the issue of salvation found in the book of Romans. First of all, we find out in the book of Romans that we are saved from terrible sin. The first issue that we want to know about is, you know, saved. The word saved means if you're going to get saved, you're going to have to get saved from something, which is one of the major, one of the problems we have in the world today is people think that salvation has nothing to do with, you know, uh, heaven or hell. Salvation has nothing to do with, uh, you know, my being in peril and my being in jeopardy and, um, and my being rescued. People think today that salvation is just making a choice to live for God. It's a lifestyle choice. I got to tell you something, salvation is far more than a lifestyle choice. Salvation is far more than just deciding that you're a conservative-minded person rather than a liberal-minded person, that you have a spiritual bent to you rather than a worldly bent to you. Salvation is far more than that. It's not just one of those things where, you know, someone comes to your door one day, knocks on the door, invites you to come to a church, and you get to thinking about it, and church would be a place where your kids would grow up with some good friends, and they'd uh, meet some good friends there, and uh, church Church would be something that, uh, you know, would, would be teach you things that would help you in your, in your marriage. And church would teach you how to have your best life now and be a better you and all those kind of things. And, um, yeah, you know, and I think that would be a good idea for me to go to church. Uh, 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 salvation is far more than just finding out how to have your best life now. Amen. The fact of the matter is we are sinners. And because we're sinners, we face the judgment of God. We need to be saved. And so Romans chapter, chapters 1 through 3 deals with the issue that we are saved from terrible sin. I find, the first, I, find, uh, uh, I find first the wickedness of our sins throughout these chapters 1 through 3. And we're not going to read them all, but I want to read um, two major passages that have to do with our sin, how God views a, sinner, a sinful man. Romans chapter 1 verses 21 through 31. The Bible says that because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and, cre and creeping things wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their, own, their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of er their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God, and yeah, I'm going to stop right there. Right now on the news, they've been having this thing on there, um, but up in Seattle, they're getting ready to have a um, a, uh, um, there's some kind of conference going on and, uh, and Pastor Hutchison's going to teach there from the whatever church in downtown Seattle and, and, um, and they're all worried about it because it's the gay rights people are going to protest this, uh, this uh, conference because what they're saying that these believers, that these Christians there are the extremist anti-gay people. And all they are is just Christians who understand what Romans chapter 1 verses 21 through 31 have to do. That's all it is. is we're not ex the, that's not extremist. Being anti-gay is not extremist. It's being biblicist. Anyway, we'll go on from there. Uh, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to to parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. He's describing here the wickedness of man and begins to describe their sin. It goes on, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. 
With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Can you see the Apostle Paul in prayer for these people? God help them to recognize if they're saved what they were saved from. Help them to see how horrible their sin was. And for that person who is lost, help them, Heavenly Father, come to a place of deep conviction about their sins. This morning in my devotions, I was reading in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, where the Bible says after Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says the, the people's hearts, they were pricked in their hearts. The word pricked means to be pierced thoroughly. And that's what we need today. I think, you know, pierce, when I picture the pierce, you know, first, of course, there's the spear idea. But, you know, then I took the, you know, word being the seed and all that. And I thought, you know, what we got is a whole lot of uh, people that are getting, um, taking some little stick and they're getting a, about a quarter inch deep uh, uh, hole. And they're planting the seed in there about a quarter inch deep. And uh, what we need today is we're going to plant the seed in there. We need someone to just pierce our heart clear through and punch that seed in there where it can't get back out. And, uh, and nobody can get to it. And, um, and that's what we need today is, uh, you know, I mean, and I can see the apostle Paul praying, God help them to come to a place where they understand and they are under conviction and there is terror and there is fear in their souls about the sin that they've been involved in. And for those who are saved, help them, Heavenly Father, to recognize that, that when they sin, their sin is against you and you only and help them to come to a place that they appreciate their salvation that much more because they recognize the sin that you forgave him of. Not only um, do we find in verses one through chapters one through three um, that uh, you know the, the the terribleness of our sin, but we also find out that we have no excuse for our sin. We cannot excuse ourselves. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal uh, power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God says, the, you need, the people need to understand this. They are without excuse. There's no, they can't get to heaven and say, I know I was a sinner, but God, it's not my fault I was a sinner. He said they they are without excuse. Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. You're inexcusable for your sin. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So what he says is we are terrible sinners and that we have no excuse for being terrible sinners. And because we are sinners and because we are without excuse, the other thing we find out in chapters 1 through 3 is that God has a great wrath for our sin. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Romans chapter 2 and verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Romans chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil from the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now the fact that God would save us, we who are so guilty of sin and we whose sin is so, or whose sin is so wicked and we who's, um, who face the wrath of God and that God would save us is such a truth that if we ever got a hold of it, we'd never be sad again. If we ever really came to the place where we understood what salvation is, we would rejoice, period. Who cares what this world does? Who cares what people say? Who cares whether we're, whether, uh, we're on, a, on, a, on an easy road or a rough road? We are saved. 
I mean, we were, I mean, when you come to a place where you recognize the condemnation you were under, the wrath that you were facing, and that God would save you from that, once that's happened, I mean, everything else seems pretty, pretty petty after that. And uh, if you come to the place where you understand it, number one, we are saved from terrible sin. Romans also teaches us that, number two, we are saved completely by faith. Chapter four tells us that. And, um, and I, again, just got to go through this real quickly. Chapter four and verse three, for what saith the scripture? Sure. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Well, that's fine. Abraham was saved by believing. All he did was believe and because he believed, God said he was righteous. All right, that's fine for Abraham. What about me? Romans chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it, it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. See, the same thing that happened to Abraham can happen to us and has happened to us if we've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't have, you know, we don't have to do anything to be saved but to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is fantastic news because I know I could never do enough to be saved. I couldn't be good enough to be saved, but I don't have to be. I only have to believe on him that raised up Jesus from the dead. Number three, we are saved through Jesus Christ. That's in chapters five and six. Romans chapter five and verse one. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter five and verse eight. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter six and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the reason I don't have to work out my own salvation is because Jesus already worked it out for me. Amen. That's exactly why I don't have to work. That's exactly why I don't have to try to earn my salvation. That's exactly why I don't have to even fear the wrath of God because Jesus has already paid the price that needed to pay, uh, be paid for, uh, for, 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 for the salvation of sinners. You know what salvation, salvation is simply hiding from the wrath of God in the Lord Jesus Christ and wrath is coming. I mean, there's, not, there's no getting around it. There's no way to resist it. The devil, you know, the Antichrist, he's going to put his army together and shake his fist at Jesus and try to stop the wrath of God from coming. But he won't be able to get the job done. The wrath of God is coming. But if we'll just go and hide behind Jesus like a big brother... We're joint heirs with him, and he's the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, and we who are saved have the power to become sons of God, the Bible says. When we get saved, we, God makes us the sons of God, and what we're doing when we get saved, we're just kind of hiding behind our big brother. And the wrath of God is coming, but we're protected by our Savior, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and that's all it is, is just trust in Jesus for protection. That's what salvation is. Number four, we are saved and justified. Romans chapters uh, 7 through 8 have to do with the issue of justification. And I'm not going to take lots of time with this, but just kind of read a couple of scriptures and a couple of comments. Uh, the idea of justification is a, is a huge subject there. But Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 24, and then reading down to Romans 8 and verse 2, Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with, my, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. That's wonderful, wonderful news if you think about it. You know, as far as God is concerned, I'm not just a sinner who's um, slid by the judgment of God because I'm hiding in Jesus. Okay, I, I want to, I, and I did say salvation is just hiding in Christ for protection. And that it is. But when you come to Jesus Christ for salvation, it's not like you're just a wicked sinner and God knows you're a wicked sinner, but he can't see you because you're hiding behind Jesus. In God's eyes, when you came to Jesus Christ, you became clean. He's given you the very righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, And it's more than just, you know, uh, God saying, oh, okay, you know, you're hanging on to Jesus, so I'll let you come by. No, when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And God now looks at us and says, there is therefore now no condemnation. You are completely justified in the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll never... 
God will never remember our sins again. He'll never bring them up again. It's not like God is up in heaven saying, I know I saved you, but I still remember. And I know there's a bunch of people who think that way, don't you? I know he saved me. I believe I'm going to go to heaven, but I think God's just kind of, I mean, he's just looking for the next opportunity to slap me upside the head because he still remembers. No, the Bible says you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and those sins are washed away and he never remembers them again. You are justified when you get saved. Number five, we are saved and have a, a burden for others. In chapters nine through 10, the apostle Paul begins to speak about his own personal burden for souls to be saved. Now that he knows Jesus, Jesus Christ, and he knows the wonders of salvation personally, he sure does want others to understand that salvation too. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness that in the hope, bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that with great, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel as they might be saved. And then Romans 10 verses 13 through 14. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right. Wonderful. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? The natural progression is I have this burden for souls to be saved. And salvation is simple as calling upon the name of the Lord. But how can it happen unless somebody preaches? The natural progression for a person who preaches, who uh, appreciates salvation is to preach salvation. It's the natural, it is the logical conclusion. When you are saved and you grasp salvation, the natural conclusion is to want to tell others how to be saved like you are because you know that they can't ever be saved until someone tells them how to be saved. It's just the way it's going to, you know, you understand that when you get saved, once you're saved. Number six. We are saved and, um, and, and given spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12 has to do with the spiritual gifts. Chapters 12 verses 6 through 8 says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. These, these are spiritual gifts, and, and what they do is they, is they change us from the sort of person we once were and they enable us to do the good works that God has created us to do once we're, uh, when we get saved and they empower us to serve as useful members of a local church. And that's why he says when a person has these gifts and they exercise those gifts, that's when they um, continuing instant in prayer and, uh, and those kind of things. And they love without dissimulation and that type of thing. When they, when they exercise the spiritual gifts that God gives them at the moment of salvation, it changes us. It changes the way we behave. It changes uh, the things that we like. It changes uh, the burdens that we have in our life. Which brings us to the last point tonight. I'll be done with this. We are saved, number seven, to walk in newness of life. Now, Romans chapter 6 is where he says when we're baptized that we're buried in the likeness of his death and we're raised to walk in newness of life. But I borrowed that phrase from Romans 6 and brought it here to chapters 13, 14, and 15. Chapter 16 is, is really, it's just a conclusion, and, um, and I, I shouldn't say just a conclusion. It's the conclusion of the, of the book of Romans, and, uh, and I probably could have uh, got another point out of it, but seven points is enough for tonight. And, you know, it's where he's saying, you know, greet this person, greet that person, thank God for this person, and so forth. And there, there's application, but I, I chose to kind of just uh, uh, not worry about uh, chapter 16 tonight. Chapters 13, 14 and 15 have to do with um, the, the, the character of a saved person. And uh, chapter 13 speaks of submitting to the powers that God places over our lives. And, uh, and I know it talks about more than that, but that's the main subject of chapter 13. Submission to authority. Submit, a saved person recognizes authority and becomes submissive to authority. It's a, can you imagine? I mean, see, when we're praying for people and we're praying that they understand the wonders of salvation, can you see that one of the things you're praying for is that they will learn to submit to the powers that God places in their life? 
That's one of the things that you can pray for that would be a just and a worthwhile thing to pray for people about, that a person would come to understand salvation and the responsibility to submit to authorities. Not just that, you know, that we buckle down and we follow this person and that person, but that we come to a place where we understand the relationship of salvation and submission to powers to authorities in our life. Chapter 14 has to do with, um, uh, it speaks of, of not getting into doubtful disputations, you know, and, uh, uh, un, you know, understanding that everyone's going to be, we're all, every one of us who are saved, we will all stand for ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. I do not need to judge you. God's going to do a good enough job on you himself, uh, and, um, but he's also going to do, do a good job on me. Rather than spend all my time trying to judge you, I ought to go ahead and try to figure out what i got to fi get fixed in my life. I'm going to stand before him too. And I want to make sure when I stand before him, I can stand before him without shame. I can stand before him, uh, you know, and, 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 and have, have crowns and rewards to cast back at his feet. I want to, rather than spend all my time worrying about everybody else and judging everybody else and condemning everybody else, I just need to be dealing with myself. The doubtful disputations thing and getting into that, uh, you know, area of arguing about this and arguing about that. Rather than doing that stuff, just come to a place where I just, I get to know God's word and I obey God's word to the best of my ability. And you know, if the, every one of us would do that, if we just get in the word of God and start obeying that Bible, it'd probably, I mean, churches would have a whole bunch more unity. If everybody just decides, you know, instead of trying to figure out why this person said that and why this person sat over here and why this person didn't do this and why this person did do that and where was this person, instead of doing all that, if we just get into our Bibles and the best of our ability, under, ask the Holy Spirit of God to teach us the Word of God and then by the grace of God obey His Word, I mean, it'd just do an awful lot. It, it, that'd be revival for sure in a church. Chapter 13 speaks of submitting to powers. Chapter 14 speaks about not getting into doubtful disputation. Chapter 15 speaks about bearing the infirmities of the weak. Bearing one another's burdens. Recognizing that there are believers who need someone to come alongside and be a comfort and, 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 and to be a cheer and to bear the infirmities of the weak. Now, none of these things, submitting to powers, uh, staying out of doubtful disputations, and bearing, the, none of the, and bearing in the infirmities of the weak, none of those things are, are um, natural for an unsaved person. They all can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit after salvation. I can hear the Apostle Paul right now. And he's writing to these Roman believers. He said, man, I tell you this, I'm praying for you. Every time I pray, I pray for you without ceasing. I make mention of you in my prayers. And I'm praying that God will open a door, that I can get up there and that I can see you. And I know this is how a preacher would pray, but there's a way you can apply it for yourself too. And he's praying, I'm praying that, that, that I can get up there and see you because, man, I desire to impart some spiritual gift to you. I'd like to help you to be established in the faith. I'd like to... Help help you to come to a place in your spiritual life where you've got strength and you've got stability and where the problems that happen don't blow you out of the uh, out of the saddle for God. I'd like to give you something that can help you. And as he does, they, uh, then he goes right from that saying, this is what I want to do is impart some spiritual gift to you to establish you in the faith. He moves right from that, transitions right from that, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And goes right from there to bring this treatise, treatise on the issues of salvation. Boy, that's something to pray for. And by the way, I got to thinking about this. If all we ever did is pray for Christians to understand salvation, well, we'd have plenty to pray about. You ever have one of those days where you're just not sure what to pray about? Just started praying for people to understand. If, if you took the time to study out the book of Romans and used it as a prayer list, and said, I'm going to start praying for everybody in my church. And I, in fact, let's just s s narrow it down. I'm going to pray for everyone in my family that they would understand salvation as it's described in the book of Romans. Well, you'd spend the rest of your life just praying right there. Figuring out what to pray and then doing the praying. That would just be plenty for you. But I've got, I got book after book after chapter after chapter we're going to go through. So it's month after month we're going to go through. Uh, by the time we get done, you're going to be able to pray without ceasing.